you guys, it's October 30th, and this is the penultimate installment of my Eek Week Halloween Week movie review series. And even though I said I was going to do more family-friendly stuff, uh, that'll be for tomorrow. <laughs> for today, we're actually doing one of my, I guess, beloved B-movie, uh, you know, B-horror movie schlock from the 1980s, late 1980s. I first saw this, uh, rented from the video store, as I guess most people did, uh, back in the late 1980s and quickly became a favorite. It's just kind of like there's something about this particular movie that even though it's really schlocky and really cliched, you could even say that I don't I don't think I'd go as far as to call it like an Evil Dead ripoff, but you can tell that, you know, that they were really into Evil Dead and wanted to use some of the stuff in it, but honestly, there's something about the vibe of this movie that really kind of elevates it and I think that it's one of the reasons why it's one of the better remembered kind of 80s schlock horror classics. This is, of course, 1988's Night of the Demons. Now, this movie, I was like watching, it's fascinating, if you go on YouTube, as, at least as, uh, as, as at the time of this recording, there's actually a documentary, it's about an hour and 17 minutes long, and it's called You're Invited, and it's all about the making of this movie, and it's really, really interesting. They got, like, pretty much all the cast members back, like, to talk about it, all the filmmakers, and all this kind of stuff, and it's just, um, you can tell they had a really good time making this movie, and you wouldn't necessarily think it because of, you know, like I said, its reputation as being this kind of, like, schlocky B-horror. It's not, it's not really a slasher. It's almost kind of like a combination slasher, sort of like demon-y, Evil Dead type of movie. But there actually was some really uh, great talent behind it. And, you know, so it, it, so it just goes to show just because the movie was cheap or whatever, uh, that doesn't mean that there weren't massive, masses of talent going on behind the camera. So this was actually directed by Kevin S. Tenney. Tenney and he had done Witchboard prior uh, in 1986, which is another movie I need to get to because I actually re remember liking that a lot. I think I saw it a bunch of times on cable back in the day. And uh, he wasn't, it's weird because I was watching like an interview with him and he wasn't like a big horror movie fan, um, but he just kind of ended up making them because I guess they were cheaper and that's what the market was and everything like that. So it's just funny to like to hear him to talk about it. So a lot of the stuff that came out about this movie was almost kind of like, I don't want to say it was like accidental, but they didn't really do it on purpose exactly. This movie, um, initially when they were conceiving it, it was supposed to be called Halloween Party, which, you know, I'm not going to, that's kind of a dumb title, I'm just saying, but, so I'm glad they did call it that. But it was originally called Halloween Party, but what ended up happening was that the guy that was the producer on John Carpenter's Halloween, uh, Mustafa Akkad, I think his name is, he basically, I don't think he was threatening them necessarily, but he was basically like, well, you can't use that title because... Ma, ma, ma. Like, you know what I mean? I, and I didn't realize that because the movie, you know, John Carpenter's Halloween was called Halloween, I didn't realize that you couldn't call anything Halloween blah. You know what I mean? So, but I guess, I don't know if that was like really true or not, but he basically said, yeah, you can't call it Halloween party because then I'm going to sue you or whatever. So then like, <laughs> put it in a nice way. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sue you in a nice way. But uh, so yeah, so they had to end up changing the name to Night of the Demons. They said everything that they had done up to that point, like all the marketing, because I think the movie was done through, because they said during the whole entire filming it was called Halloween Party. And honestly, they even had to redo like part of the credits, like the opening credit sequence, which I'll get to in a minute because that's one of my favorite things about this movie. But because they had already made the title sequence that had the title Halloween Party on it, so they had to do, when they did um, the title Night of the Demons, they had to just like make it, <laughs> they had to like make it bigger than the original title so they could like paste it over like on the film, which I thought was really funny. And also, can we talk about the long animated sequence, which starts this, like the long credit sequence at the beginning? Because like I said earlier that I was going to bring that up. Wow, I really, really love the animated sequence at the beginning of this. And it was actually done by a woman who was an animator at Disney. And she was kind of like known as the go-to person for doing Disney villains. Like she'd worked on Aladdin. She worked on Jafar. She did uh, Ursula from Little Mermaid. Made. So she was kind of that person and uh, they wanted her to do it because I guess they were she was like friends with some of the filmmakers on this. So she ended up doing this gorgeous like animated sequence, which 
you know, if you see it, you it's very clearly uh, inspired by Night on Ball Mountain from Fantasia, which she said that's what she wanted. That's the look that she wanted because she always loved Night on Ball Mountain. And uh, so she made something that was kind of like that. And honestly, they went back and forth because like one of the producers and or I think it was the director and he's like, look, can we, can we please just have like a plain, uh, you know, credit sequence because like this is going to be costing me way too much money. It's like I could actually use that money in other ways. But once they saw like some of the rough cut of the credit sequence, like the animation, they're like, man, that looks so cool though. And it's like, but you know, it cost them a lot of money, but they said in the end it was kind of worth it. And I totally agree because it's really, really cool looking. So yeah, that's actually one of the highlights of the movie for me is that really long animated sequence. And they said it was really funny because at first, because like I said, to save money, they were trying to, they said, well, we'll do the animated sequence, but we'll only do like the, you know, the five big names on the cast or crew or whatever. So it won't be super long. But then once people started seeing like the rough cut, they were just kind of like, no, I want to be in, the, I want to be in the animated one too. So they had to make it like three and a half, four minutes long to like accommodate everybody. And it ended up costing them a shit ton of money. But honestly, um, it looks so cool that you know, you can't really argue with the effectiveness. So I'm kind of glad that they spent the extra money to do it. So what happens in this movie? Like I said, it's not uh, super original. It's not, you know, like this great conceptual like art film or anything like that. It's just like a very fun throwaway 80s movie. Uh, so you got this goth chick, Angela, and she is throwing a Halloween party at this place called Hull House, which is like a former mortuary and there was all kind of other like shenanigans that went on there. I think there's some uh, stuff about necrophilia and some murders that went on there and stuff like that. And also uh, you find out later on in the movie, there's also uh, the old 80s thing of it's built over an Indian burial ground or, you know, there's a, there's a story in there about uh, a Native American who went crazy on the property because it's supposedly possessed and then he killed his wife and made a TP out of her intestines or something like that. So it's like there's all that kind of stuff. So so she's having a party. She's kind of the weird girl, but I guess everybody just thinks it's, you know, it's Halloween night. So so let's go to the scariest party possible. Uh, she also has a friend named Suzanne, played by the awesome Linnea Quigley, who's always fun to see. She's just like a super fun, she seems like a super fun lady. And uh, she had been in a bunch of horror movies prior to this. I'm pretty sure uh, Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Bolorama was before this one, maybe like the year before. But I guess when they cast her, the guy that cast her didn't realize that she'd been in a shit ton. Like he knew that she'd been in some horror movies, but didn't know that she was like Scream Queen, like everybody was into it. And it's interesting because I was watching an interview with her about this movie too. And she said, well, they kept calling me, like wanting me to be on this movie. And she's like, and I, at first I didn't want to do it because they're supposed to be high school kids. And she's like, and I was like 26 or 27. And she's like, and I looked too old, you know, she's, and she was saying that I'd had experience of going around, you know, to audition for other movies and them saying, yeah, you're too old to be like a high school student. But she's like, when she got there, she's like, they just kept calling and calling. So finally I went. And she's like, I didn't even have to audition, really. They just gave me the part because they just wanted her. So, you know, but like I said, that's kind of like, that's going back to the 1950s. It's like, you know, all these fucking horror and sci-fi, like, B-movies. And they all like these quote-unquote high school students that all look like they're about 30 years old. And everybody does in this one, too. And it's fine. Even though I'm pretty sure, I think the one guy that plays Sal in this, I think he said that he was only 18, like, during the filming of this movie. And it's crazy, like, when you see him in the uh, documentary, he looks like almost unchanged. It's the craziest shit ever. The first time you see Linnea Quigley, uh, very famously, it's very, I mean, most of her shots in this, it's it's not as quite as famous as like Return of the Living Dead, like the naked uh, gravestone dance, but it's getting up there. It was one of the things that I always remembered is that her introduction is basically just this massive shot of her ass. <laughs> it's just these little pink panties like over her butt. And she's like leaning over in a convenience store, distracting the two clerks so that Angela can steal a bunch of shit for their Halloween party because they're not paying for shit. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, she's dressed as Bo Peep. I think she's a uh, little Bo Peep is what she's supposed to be. And uh, Amelia Kincaid, uh, or Mimi for short, that's what they kept calling her. Uh, she plays Angela 
Angela in this, and she's great. Now, she was actually better known. She'd been in some movies and stuff, but I think she was better known as a dancer uh, she, and choreographer and stuff. She was like a backup dancer for a bunch of, uh, you know, live shows. Um, she mentioned like a whole bunch of them, like Smokey Robinson and uh, Diana Ross and stuff like that. So she'd been like a backup dancer. And then she was also in a bunch of music videos. Uh, the most famous one she mentioned was uh, Stray Cat, Sexy and 17. She was like the main girl in that. So that's kind of what she was known for. And because the script of this like called for kind of an extended dance sequence, and uh, she, so she wanted to do it. They wanted somebody that was actually a dancer and they actually let her choreograph her own thing, which is actually kind of cool. And one of the things that kind of made me fall in love with this movie, like when I first saw it on video, was because I didn't really, I mean, growing up in the late 80s, I didn't see, I mean, there were some, but I didn't see a lot of movies that had, you know, music I liked in it, like goth music and stuff. And so it was really cool to see this long extended sequence of this goth chick dancing to the Bauhaus song Stigmata Martyr, uh, you know, with the with the flashing light, the strobe light and everything. And I just thought that was so cool, like back in 1988 or 1989 or whenever it was that I saw this movie, because I was just kind of like, oh boy, like a god chick and she's listening to Bauhaus, that's so neat. I just thought that was so cool. So yeah, so those two are the ones having the party. And then you have kind of like your stock, uh, you know, few characters that are going to this party. You have kind of like, the douchey guy that's like not, I couldn't figure out if he was wearing a costume or cause he looked like Miami Vice. But then I was kind of like, well, but people did wear that kind of shit back then. Like not ironically or like not as a costume. And his girlfriend did say something about, I thought we were going to wear costumes. And then I was like, well, is he not in costume though? I thought he was Don Johnson, but I guess not. Uh, that guy was the same guy that was in Heather's like a year later. I had forgotten that dude was, uh, was in that movie because I was like, hey, it's Kurt or Ram. Which one's which? I can't remember. But he played either Kurt or I think he was Kurt, uh, Kurt or Ram in the uh, in the in Heather's. So he was in there, and then you kind of had your token like fat dude <laughs> that was like the comic relief, uh, the gross, disgusting fat guy uh, who's called Stooge, and he's wearing a pig nose at the beginning. So that's his costume. He has a pig nose, and also he has jack-o'-lantern underwear they said uh they interviewed him as well like for the documentary and they said he said yeah they asked me to like actually because there's a scene like very at the beginning when they're on the way to the party where there's this old fart that's like walking down the street and they're like yelling out the car at him and you know and stooge like hangs his ass out the window and he was he's like well they were i was supposed to like actually moon them but he's like yeah no you can't afford that it's like you know? <laughs> That's way below, that's way above your pay grade, like to see my bare ass. It's like so he had like the jack o' lantern panties instead, which you know that was kind of funny. Well, I think they thought that they wouldn't be able to see the jack o' lantern underwear, and they were like, no, we actually have to see your butt. And he's just like, no, that's not happening. So they didn't do it. So you can still you can see the jack o' lantern though. But yeah, so you got that. You got uh, the kind of final girl type girl who's dressed like Alice, uh, you know, Alice from Alice in Wonderland. And then you have like a couple of other sort of stock characters that aren't really all that. I'm trying to think of what their costumes were. One girl was Peter Pan, and then her boyfriend was like a doctor. Was he like a doctor or something? I feel like he had a stethoscope. And, uh, you know, so so there's all this kind of uh, shenanigans going on. So they all go to this uh, this house where, or this former mortuary, which of course is kind of like all falling apart and shitty and it's all creepy and everything. And that's where they're gonna have the party. And fun fact too, I actually, I would have never known this if I hadn't watched the documentary. They said the house they shot that at, they said it's not there anymore, it got torn down and they said it's a Ralph's supermarket now, or at least it was at the time they interviewed the people for the documentary. They said it looks like, because of matte paintings and stuff like that, the house looks like it's kind of by itself, like on this hill with this big like wall around it and everything. They said the crazy thing is that this is absolutely in downtown LA, like on this, on like a busy street corner. And I was like, woo, movie magic. I mean, they must have really done like some really good matte paintings. Cause I, I mean, you can tell it's a matte painting, but I didn't realize that this house was like literally right. They're, they're like, yeah, it's like a busy downtown street. Um, so, and you would never know that, like from watching, I guess I didn't really think about it. And, uh, yeah. And they also incorporated, because they said, we got this property like pretty cheap because it was, you know, kind of in rough condition and it was kind of in a shitty neighborhood. And, uh, originally I think they said that 
that uh, in the script, it said that somebody was supposed to get impaled because it was supposed to be surrounded by a wooden fence. But they said, actually, when we got to the property and it had this kind of wall around it that is not as big as it looks on camera, but they said, you know, we use some camera tricks to like to make it look bigger. But um, so they actually rewrote uh, parts of the script to accommodate the house that they ended up getting, which, like I said, I always think that's a good thing to do in horror movies is if you got a really good location, which this is a really good location, then, you know, you can always like tweak the script to fit, you know, fit in with the narrative and stuff. And they said they were able to like set up different rooms and, you know, film in different rooms and stuff like that. I will say too that the makeup effects, because basically what happens, like I said, it's not a super complicated story or anything like that. It's basically like an 80s schlocky, uh, you know, horror movie, like Evil Dead or whatever, is they start having a party. Um, they decide that they're going to have a seance, not, but not like an actual seance. It's kind of more like uh, the Peter Pan girl says, no, we should do a past life seance where we all look into a mirror and we see our past lives, which I've never heard of that, but okay, maybe that's the thing. So they find this old mirror. Uh, there's 40 bajillion like fake scares up to that. So, you know, if you don't like the fake jump scare thing, this movie is just gonna like get right, <laughs> get right on your nerves because it's ba basically like every five minutes somebody's coming up and putting their hand on somebody's shoulder or somebody's screaming and then like, oh, never mind, I just, you know, dropped something on my toe or something. It does, that doesn't happen, but it's like, it's that kind of stuff. There's tons and tons of fake scares in this, but I'll forgive it just because one, it was the 80s and two, this movie's super fun. So you know, sue me. So they're all looking in the mirror and then one of the girls like flips out because she sees like this thing that looks like a demon-y, dragon -y sort of situation like behind her and she freaks out. And then so it turns out that I guess it was this demon that was sort of trapped down in the basement, which is like the crematorium and it gets out and much like an evil dead, uh, it possesses the first person who's standing there with her mouth hanging open, who turns out to be Linnea quickly, because <laughs> she's standing there. One of her things is that she's always, she's got this compact and she's always like fixing her makeup. Like, well, I have to look pretty for the boys, you know what I mean? So she's always doing that kind of stuff, which comes into play later on. So she's standing there like putting lipstick on. So this, you know, this wisp of smoke like goes in her mouth. So now she's possessed. And then um, she actually, starts making out with Angela, which passes the demon to her, uh, and then chaos ensues. As every time somebody gets possessed by the demon, it's kind of like, you know, goes around a, like a disease kind of. So, you know, so everybody's kind of getting picked off one by one, but then they're coming back as demons. And I kind of like that they did, I mean, this is very similar, like I said, to Evil Dead, also very similar to Demons, the Italian one, you know, that was set in the um, in the movie theater, like the Dario Argento produced ones. Lamberto Bava, I think, directed that one. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of a similar premise to that, but I don't know, there's just something, like I said, there's something about this one that is just really, fun. I think it's probably because one, the special effects like the demon makeup and stuff. So the guy that did the makeup for this had just, he had actually worked on some really big movies. I think he worked on Ghostbusters. He worked on Videodrome. He wasn't like the main guy, but he was like one of the assistants. And when this movie was being made, he had just gone out on his own and like started his own company. So this was gonna be his first job where he was like the head of special effects, but he totally knew his shit. I mean, he really knew what he was doing. Um, and it shows because some of the effects in this are really, really cool. Like and all the demon makeup, like I said, they kind of made them look different, like per, you know, for whatever the person was. Like the, the makeup on Linnea Quigley looks really awesome. Like all the fucking, teeth and the crazy eyes and she really she really looks uh, horrifying and like obviously Angela looks really good too the other ones they didn't do as much I guess because those two you know women were kind of the main uh, you know attraction I suppose but uh, you know some of the other ones there's a, there's a great scene with like an arm ripping off um, and the, then the arm comes to life and like grabs somebody's ankle again very evil dead like so you can tell that that was a big influence but Probably the most famous effect scene in this, but not probably, uh, definitely the most famous effect sequence in this is Linnea Quigley after she's kind of possessed and she's sitting in this bathroom and she kind of, she pulls her shirt open because it's Linnea Quigley. So she has to be naked in the movie at some point. It's just like the law. So, but she has her lipstick, which she has been, you know, fucking with for, throughout the whole movie. And she draws kind of all over her face. And uh, then she kind of takes it like down her chest and like starts drawing spirals around her boobs 
boob and then like the lipstick she sticks the lipstick like right into her tit like right into her nipple and then it just closes right back up and it looks really good i mean obviously they made you know a prosthetic chest but it just it looks really great i mean you can tell it's fake but it doesn't look really overtly fake because like i said the special effects guy that worked on this had also worked on videodrome which obviously has that scene where you know james woods reaches into his stomach and like pulls the videotape out so he did it like much similar to how they did that even though obviously the budget on this wasn't i'm sure it wasn't nearly as much as the budget on videodrome was this one was like made super super cheaply but i guess because they got so much talent on board you know, particularly with the special effects uh, team, that it really doesn't, it's really punching above his weight, uh, above its weight as far as special effects go, because like I said, they really got a guy that had been in the industry a long time um, and had worked on a lot of really big special effects heavy movies. It's just that he had never, you know, headed the team before. So this is the first one that he got to do. And uh, he was very, very enthusiastic about it. Actually, uh, also fun fact, he ended up marrying Linnea Quigley. Uh, they met on this set. I don't see, well, obviously they, you know, they divorced and he married again later on but yeah so he was talking about because he talked about you know that's the makeup took a really really long time to put on like i think one point i think it might have been angela's makeup that you know especially like the burn one where she puts her hands in the fire and like her hands catch on fire or whatever they said that took like 11 hours to do so you would just kind of like had to sit there and stuff so he was just kind of like so you really got to know these people like up close and personal because you were sitting there for like 11 hours like putting makeup on them so yeah so so him and uh, linnea were married for a little while oh i forgot to mention too fun fact when i was talking about uh, Amelia Kincaid, the woman that played Angela, is that she was actually, not only was she quite well known as like a dancer and had been a lot of music videos and stuff, also Rue McClanahan's niece. So there you go. <laughs> One of the Golden Girls. Also, later on, she wrote a bunch of books talking about psychically communicating with your pets. So there's that also. But she seemed like a really nice lady, though. They had like a... um. They had a, a bunch of interviews with her uh, on this documentary that I watched, and she seemed super fun also. And everybody on this, they were like, yeah, it was it was strenuous. It was like hard, like all the special effects. It was like really hard to do and stuff like that. But they all seemed like they had a fucking blast making this. They're like, we just had such a good time. Everybody was just like practical joker, you know, practical jokers and all this other kind of stuff. And they just thought it was super, super fun. I always want, I also want to mention the guy, the one... <laughs> And it's kind of funny, the, t the token black guy that was in this, right? I think his name's Alvin Alexis. And he was, uh, they interviewed him extensively too. And he said, honestly, he's like, I had come out to LA and I had a return ticket. He was from New York. And he's like, and it, shit wasn't really wasn't working out in LA. So he's like, so the day, like the, the next day I had the return ticket and I was just going to go back to New York because shit wasn't working out. And he's like, but I get this phone call. And apparently the guy that they had first cast in uh, Night of the Demons, like had dropped out or couldn't do it. So his agent called him and was like, well, why don't you go down to read? And he's like, yeah, but the audition is the same time as my flight back to New York. So he's like, what if I go and I don't get it? Then I'm kind of fucked. Like I'm gonna be homeless. Cause it's like, this is, this is all the money I've got. Um, you know what I mean? It's like my, you know, I don't have any more money for rent or anything like that. But he decided like, you know, and the rest is history. He decided to not get on the plane and to go to the uh, to audition. And obviously he ended up getting it. He was very excited because as most people know, if you're any, if you know anything about '80s horror, you know, or horror in general, is that you know the the trope is, and the, it's a cliche for a reason, is that oh, the black guy is always like the first one to get killed. So he was very excited by the idea that not only does he live through most of the movie, but he also like lives through the whole movie. Like he actually sort of ends up being, because you know the the girl, like the Alice in Wonderland girl, she ends up living too, but like both of them end up surviving, and he kind of ends up saving her at the end like pulling her over the wall and getting her out of the mortuary so he so that was very like appealing to him and he's like oh i was like so excited that i was like the black guy in the horror movie that doesn't die he actually like lives through the whole thing and he's actually kind of a hero so he's like that was pretty awesome and like i said it just, it seemed like one of those things that they didn't really mean for that to happen or mean for that to be in the script necessarily but it just kind of worked out really cool so you know 
Now, the thing about this movie, too, like I said, uh, you know, Kevin Tenney had done Witchboard prior to this, and I think he did Witchboard 2 as well. Although, did I see that? I really, I remember really liking Witchboard, but it's been a while since I've seen it, so I might be totally talking out my ass there. It might be terrible, but I don't know. People still watch it nowadays, so maybe it's still good. I'll give it another uh, go, go around one of these days. But um, it, this was one of those movies that I think they kind of basically had to, like, to, I guess a lot of these kind of low-budget movies had to do this. They basically, they had to premiere it in Detroit, um, and they kind of went and talked to like this guy that owned a bunch of theater chains there, and he was like, we have $80,000 uh, for advertising, like we're going to do TV spots and newspaper and stuff, but just in Detroit, and we're going to see how it goes, and then they have to kind of like roll it out slowly. So they did that. But the weird thing, I think it made $3 million at the box office. I'm not entirely sure how much it cost to make, but I'm, I'm imagining it wasn't $3 million. But the thing about this one is that it did okay at the box office, but this is one of those movies, and anybody that grew up in the 80s will be familiar with this. It's one of those movies that nobody, like most people didn't really see it in the theater when it came out or it didn't really do much business. But then uh, when it came to video, it was one of those movies that, you know, if you were a teenager at that time or like a young adult and you would go to the, you know, video store like to get a horror movie. And that was one of the ones that like everybody saw. And I think that it was because one, the cover is fantastic. Um, you know, the cover design, it's got like Angela on it with her fucked up makeup holding an invitation. It's just a great, great cover. Very, very uh, striking. So I think that was the first thing that got people's attention. But also it was one of those movies, and I remember hearing about it through like word of mouth, because they're like, this one, you know, yeah, it's like a schlocky kind of gore fest, kind of like the Evil Dead, but it's just like, because Linnea Quigley was in it, who I was a big fan of even back then, you know, sticking lipstick in her tit, and, uh, you know, because the gore and the makeup and shit like that was so good, it, that it really got kind of like a buzz about it, even, you know, even back then before there was the internet. So it was kind of one of those video store movies that you just kind of had to see because everybody saw that one, and I think it got its reputation really kind of got bigger and bigger like from that, like from being that just kind of like a video store type of thing. I kind of feel like there's a lot of movies like that that came out back then. I don't know, I, I guess it was because, you know, yeah, people went to the movie theater back then, um, you know, obviously, but it was just kind of like, if you were younger, maybe, or you didn't have a car, I think that was what it was. Like if you were a teenager and you didn't have a car, um, you know, you could have your mom or something like take you to the video store and pick up a bunch of movies for the weekend. And, you know, I was, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of other people my age too. It's like, we always wanted to see all the horror movies and you'd kind of get, you know, a little bit of a, of a vibe going like with your friends and everything. It's like, oh, did you see this one? Did you see this one? This one was really fucked up. And all this other kind of stuff. So that's definitely um, what made this one kind of like the cult classic that it is today, even though, you know, back then, I guess it was just like another one of those, like when it played in the theaters. And like I said, I don't know if it got, it got sort of a wide release, I guess. It did start in Detroit, but then like it did well, so it kind of went to way more theaters. But this was definitely one of the ones that benefited from video store, you know, the video store boom. So yeah, I just feel like, you know, if you watch it now, like it does have flaws, obviously. Um, you know, so the characters are kind of like not super likable. A lot of them are kind of like cliched, you know, it's like, oh, here's the, here's the fat guy, here's the virginal girl, here's this, that, and the other. But I don't know what it is. There's, there's just something that, like, there's a sense of fun about it that I don't, get from a lot of 80s movies, you know what I mean? Even though this is kind of similar, it's still just kind of a good time. I do kind of feel like in the third act, it drags a little bit because I think that once most of the people in the mortuary have started turning into demons, then it's kind of good. But, and you know, I don't know, a lot of horror movies have this where, you know, then it's just kind of like the survivors like having to like creep through the hallways, like trying to avoid the demons and everything like that. And that does kind of go on a while, but Honestly, that doesn't even really bother me all that much. Um, you know, the movie's not long. It's only 89 minutes. So even though it does drag a little bit in the third act, I really think that that's one of the only flaws that it has. Like I said, it's one of those movies that 
It's great right around Halloween because it's set on Halloween. It's about a Halloween party. Everybody's in costumes. You know, they're having a Halloween party at this mortuary. And so it really has that vibe, that sense of fun to it. I have to say, too, that I really, really like the sort of, I, I guess you would call it like a story bookend. But remember when I said at the beginning, like the fat guy is stooge and he's kind of like mooning this, this, cra this cranky old bastard like that's walking down the street and at first i kind of liked that they set it up like oh why are these teenagers these fucking you know whippersnappers they're picking on this old man who's just like walking home with his groceries or whatever then it turns out that he uh was actually an asshole so you don't really feel bad because you it turns out at the end there's like a little coda like after you know the survivors escape the mortuary and the sun comes up and they're kind of like walking home all bedraggled like in the daylight and then the old guy's like oh they've been out all night those little bastards blah, blah, blah. and they, they're kind of like that and then it turns out that when he was coming back from the grocery store he'd actually bought like a shit ton of apples and a shit ton of razor blades and he was gonna put, and he put all the razor blades in the apples but then it turned out that like they didn't get any trick or treaters. So his uh, l his nice little old grandma wife she um, made apple pie out of all that he ate it without so all of this. There's a really great like last scene where all the um, the razors are like coming out of his neck and it's all blood and everything. And then I love the way the his wife is just kind of like happy Halloween to you. <laughs> like he's very fucking dead. <laughs> because he told like the kids earlier you're gonna get what you deserve you know what i mean which i guess they kind of did but he did too so i thought that was kind of a nice little touch but yeah this is definitely a movie that you put on at a halloween party or you know it's the night before halloween or it's halloween night you get a bunch of beers you get some of your friends you get you know it's just like a fun kind of fun party movie and uh you know so as, as long as you don't expect anything else from it i think it's definitely one of the best ones of that genre uh from the 1980s and if you're into 80s horror like schlocky b horror at all uh you definitely should see it like i said there's a lot of things that elevate it particularly the special effects which i think still look great so yeah if you haven't seen it definitely check it out uh, i think they remade it in 2009 although i haven't heard much good about it. i haven't seen it so uh, you know i don't know i don't have an opinion but um this one had a that had a sequel that came out 89 90 i don't remember when the sequel came out but it did have one sequel and then the remake i didn't i don't i'm pretty sure i didn't see the sequel and i know i didn't see the remake but uh, i heard the remake wasn't very good i don't know if that's true or not but uh night of the demons is available on most streaming services uh including shutter so if you want to go watch it on shutter that's what i would recommend that's what i did and also um if you know if it's still on youtube go and check out uh it's called you're invited uh you know the making of night of the demons or whatever and it's actually really interesting like if you're into that movie and they got pretty much it looked like they got pretty much the whole cast and crew to come back and talk about it um and it's about an hour and 17 minutes and it's actually really interesting and that's where i got a lot of the information for this video so definitely go check that out as well if you if you would like to and that will do it for this uh eek week installment and i will see you guys tomorrow for actual halloween bye